Hello. So in this video for Black History Month 2024, we're going to talk about Ida Faubert's poetry collection, Cœur de Ile, or Island Heart. So uh, Faubert was an interesting person. She lived this sort of in-between type life that was very, very common for artists, writers, bohemians, socialites, between the sort of fin de siècle period of the 1890s through the Roaring Twenties. Um, Faubert was a Haitian poet, but um, her father was French, I think? Um, no, sorry, her mother was French. Um, her father was Haitian President Lysias Salomon, uh, and her mother was Florentine Poitier, um, if that's helpful to you. Uh, so Faubert went back and forth between Port-au-Prince and Paris, primarily. She was well-established, and she was a... a a recognizable figure in the literary world, both of Haiti and of France in this period. Um, she was also from a, a very uh, powerful family, as you can tell, based on the fact that her father had been president of Haiti. Um, I think her husband, uh, da, 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 if I can find his name, doesn't matter. I think her husband was a diplomat, if I remember correctly. So basically, she was well-connected. Um, they had money. They had social status. And so Faubert was able to sort of parlay this into um, a position within the literary world, right? She was, uh, she, she was running salons. She was uh, working with the people who were running major literary magazines at the time, both, again, in Haiti and in France. So she was in these, these literary and artistic circles. Um, she was also in between, probably, sexually and romantically. Um, she was married to a man. They divorced. Uh, they did have children together. And then she probably had relationships with women. But that's that seems to be more speculative based on at least um, Danielle Legros-Georges' uh, introduction here. Um, so so she was, again, in this sort of bohemian space of sort of sexual freedom that you got in that, again, fin de siècle up through uh, the Roaring Twenties period. But then artistically, she's also in a kind of interesting in-between space because on the she is a... a she is a poet who is very, very solid in terms of her craft. Like she writes um, form poems, basically, or not necessarily form poems, but her she has a regular meter, a regular rhyme scheme. She uses a structure to her poetry, and she writes about these somewhat older thematics. Like, the, a, a lot of her poems, as you'll see when I start sort of reading some of them for you, a lot of her poems are somewhat more aligned with, say, 19th century writers, uh, Romantic era, but then also I would say, like, uh, some of the pre-Raphaelites and people like this. Um, although I think the pre I don't know if the pre-Raphaelites were a French thing, necessarily, but for me, someone with a background in British literature. Um, so so a lot of her sort of thematics are, a lot of these are love poems. And so the thematics are longing, desire, pain at separation from the beloved, etc., etc. But one of the other interesting things about Faubert's poetry is that the imagery that she utilizes reflects that sort of in-betweenness of, of her life um, because she uses particularly plant imagery. There's a lot of discussion of um, being in gardens, of plants, of the sense of plants, etc., etc. Um, and she uses those 
She uses a mix of things that would be characteristic of the Caribbean, like jasmine, for instance, is, is really a tropical plant, but then also things that would be more characteristic of Europe, of France, like roses. Um, I guess roses are actually mostly native to Asia, but um, much more common in European gardening than than traditionally they would have been in Caribbean gardening. So Faubert's imagery, her style, reflects these sort of interstitial spaces or liminal spaces. Um, and and I think it's I think she's very interesting for these reasons. So I'm going to read you some of the poems. Um, the first couple that I'm going to read are really going to sort of emphasize that love thematic, that 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 um, romantic component, and you'll see some of these some of this imagery that I was talking about. So the first one I'm going to read is dusk, um, crepuscule in French. It is calm tonight. A fragrance floats through the air. Sleeping nature is endlessly sweet, but in my heart something weeps, deeply weeps. The night seems filled with caresses. The flowers surely dream of the morning bird who will bring them a tender token, an innocent kiss. The garden's almond tree shivers in the passing wind. The weightless butterflies who seemed so happy to crisscross the space now close their golden wings. The pines let flow between their frail branches a breeze that murmurs a sad faraway song, and the timid moon appears utterly white in the uncertain night. It is cool, in my heart something shudders. The scent of dying white lilacs floats in the air, and slowly I feel myself faltering in the midst of these perfumes. So again, she's really fascinated with scent, and the sense of plants. So in this case, we have pines, we have lilacs. Um, these, I mean, pines are not really a Caribbean thing, as far as I know. So this, this is definitely associating us with sort of nor more northerly climates like France. Um, lilacs, I'm not sure about. I'm not really a plants person, so these are, these are my sort of general suppositions, but we get that sort of that element there of um, a sort of European ecology here. So the next one I'm going to read is another love poem. Um, it's called Pleasure, uh, Volupte. And that doesn't seem like the right pronunciation. My French is not good. I'm learning French, but I'm not really there yet. Um, so, pleasure. One day I'll go to the one who calls me. I'm helpless against his will. I'll adorn myself with the rarest jewels, with summer flowers, so he finds me beautiful. I'll glide toward him, lithe as a fairy. I'll go as if, uh, I'll go by as if a shadow in flight. The scent of my hair, perfumed by lilacs, will lace the night. He will see me coming, elegant on the way. In my white dress and floating veil, he will give me his heart, his soul entirely. I must go finally to the one who awaits me. Then I will tell him, here I am. I bring you all the night's perfumes, all the wood shivers, all the wild hope I carry deep within me, all the love songs that tremble in, in my voice. I will say, here I am. I bring you my dream, made of tenderness and great beauty. Because the days pass quickly, because life is brief, intoxicate yourself with me. I am pleasure. So, this is an interesting one because one of the things that um, Georges did when she translated these is she actually drops the rhyme scheme from French that is consistent in Faubert's writing. So, um, the first stanza here. In the English translation, it, it, it ends with the words, me, will, jewels, and beautiful. No rhyme scheme. Zero rhyme, sir. But in the French, the last words are m'appelle, volante, belle, lettre. So... 
m'appelle un bel rhyme volant de let rhyme. We have an ABAB rhyme scheme. In the French, um, in the second stanza, it's B, Fui, Fui, Nui. So again, ABAB. Or I guess C, D, C, D. Whatever. You get my point. Every stanza has an ABAB rhyme scheme. And in the English translation, they don't. So that is one thing that's worth noting. That that's, that's gone from the English translations here. Um, so Faubert is, is more... Her poems are more crafted, I would say, than the English translations I'm reading necessarily represent. But they're still beautiful translations, still beautiful poems in their own in their own right. Um, they just don't have some of the technical elements that characterize Faubert's writing in the original French. So uh, the next one I'm going to read you. This is another in that sort of romantic tradition, but this is more of the despair, death, woe is me type type style of romantic poetry. This is called When You Are Told. Quand on vous dira in French. When you are told that I went softly one night into the unknown, that a wild desire came over me to see you and be consoled, when you are told that my tender heart gave way to too much pain, that my passion is utterly gone, that I sank into great silence, when you are told that my veiled eyes in an empty room sought you out in vain, that for you I spoke desperate words with time passing too quickly, when you're told that you're alone, that I've gone beyond these shores far from hot suns, that a cold shroud now covers all our old dreams, pain will trouble your spirit, you'll lament the love I take with me, but regrets will come too late when you are told why I've died. So again, this is more in the sort of melancholic vein that we get maybe it's a less morbid um, version of, of the style pioneered by people like Charles, uh, Charles Baudelaire. Um, this sort of obsession with death kind of, kind of poetry. So the next one I'm going to read you uh, to my son. Amonfi, uh, takes actually quite a different stance. And this is really a war poem. Um, World War I poetry is an interesting genre in its own right, because you have the people like uh, Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, who are very brutal and realistic about the devastation wrought by World War I. But then you have another school of poets. Um, there's one really famous one in English, and he, his name is escaping me at the moment. Um, but you have this other school of poets that still has this kind of romanticized view of, of war, especially early in the war. Um, and To My Son is definitely in that camp, um, because Faubert's son did serve in, in World War I. Uh, and so this poem is, is about that service. So this is to my son. Tottering, you ran once in a clear sun-filled garden. Now you say, let's play war. The history of heroes troubles your sleep. Gladly you go off to dig trenches, all the while hoping to command. You want crosses pinned to your, eager young, to your young eager heart. Quickly you leap into the sand. Will you lead the attack? Your tin-plate sword has a striking air. What happened to your little hoop? Oh, my son, oh you, my beautiful hope, because you so happily run into battle, learn the lessons of France's children. Know how to look like those fierce soldiers. Take all their pride and courage, watch them live, and above all, die. Remember, like them, that in the storm honor must not falter. Know they have uttered the greatest farewell to their loves while still young and handsome. Know that one day, later, deep inside you, you will feel that you'll shake the soul of heroes. So I actually find this a really fascinating poem because I would put it more into the category of sort of romanticizing war because of what we get in the last portion 
Um, phrases like learn the lessons of France's children, know how to look like those fierce soldiers, um, take, take their all, take their all their pride and courage. Uh, remember like them that in the storm honor must not falter. These kinds of phrases suggest to me a, a glorification of war, that combat is something sort of grand and noble, and yet there are also these, these subtle elements, like this phrase, gladly you go off to dig trenches, and your tin plate sword. These kinds of things also suggest a, an awareness of the hollowness of the rhetoric around heroism, especially by the time of World War I, when things, when the war was so destructive, um, when there was so little sort of gallantry and honor to be found. Um, th this, this seems to me like a kind of transitional poem that I think is really, really interesting. So, the last one I'm going to read for you uh, is called Rondel to Mademoiselle R.G. And this is an interesting one because there's a whole series of poems here addressed to women. Um, so, this, this is one of them. Rondel to Mademoiselle R.G. With your bewitching eyes whose dark beauty haunts us with the seductive glaze... Uh, so, sorry, the seductive grace of the most charming fowler. You're like the lovely buds of the enchanting blue countries with your bewitching eyes whose dark beauty haunts us. To ease all pains, your voice is lulling, and one thinks you care, but you cause such grief with your bewitching eyes. So again, one of the things in Faubert's later life is she does seem to have been at least romantically interested in women. And this series of poems directed toward different women um, suggests that. So it's an interesting, uh, again, it's an interesting component of her life and who she was as a person. Again, part of this sort of liminality, this traveling between two worlds, whether that's the world of Haiti and the world of France, whether that's the world of heterosexuality and homosexuality, whether that's the world of romanticization and cynicism, whatever it is, she seems to sort of navigate these very fluid boundaries for her, and I think she does it really, really well. 